Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to explore transpersonal psychology and its evolution. With me is Professor Jorge Ferrer, who is Professor of East-West Psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies. He is the author of several books, including Revisioning Transpersonal Theory, A Participatory Vision of Human Spirituality. His He's also a co-editor of an anthology called The Participatory Turn, Spirituality, Mysticism, and Religious Studies, and most recently, Participation and the Mystery, Transpersonal Essays in Psychology, Religion, and Education. Welcome, Jorge. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you as, as well. You are known as a pioneer of what's called the second wave of transpersonal psychology. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I guess it would be useful for our viewers to know a little bit more about the first wave. What, what preceded uh, yes. you? What, and, and let's, let, I guess many viewers will know that transpersonal mm -hmm. psychology is the branch of psychology that studies spiritual experience. Exactly. And consciousness and differences of consciousness. I would say that, um, even before these two waves, uh, there was what is called like the, the, the birth of the transpersonal yes. psychology movement, you know, and that was like uh, in the late 60s, you know, mm -hmm. with the work with Abraham Maslow and Stanislav Grof, you know. Yes. And, uh, and it was like a psychology that was uh, trying to move beyond uh, humanistic psychology to encompass uh, in, as its object of study also the farthest reaches of human nature in yeah. the words of Abraham Maslow, you know. Not only uh, uh, a psychology of psychopathology of what goes wrong in the human being, but how can we grow beyond the average and what happens to human beings when they grow beyond the average that was humanistic psychology mm -hmm. but then uh, at that point in the late 60s you know uh, there was like two movements that confluence in california and in other places one was like the countercultural movement and mm -hmm. the psychedelic movement and the other was like the, uh, the coming into the west and in america in particular of eastern gurus and eastern spiritualities yes so these psychologists were interested in these further riches and then they start kind of like experimenting with psychedelics and they are also studying with these indian gurus and they start realizing well, there is some, something interesting here, you know, like uh, some of these states that we access with psychedelics seems like very similar to what these Indian gurus are talking about that reflect like higher stages of human development mm -hmm. beyond the normal egoic functioning. So I would say that that was kind of like the birth of the transpersonal movement. Mm -hmm. And like all births, uh, it was very much grounded in the uh, life experience of the founders. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Stanislav Grof uh, was one of the founders and uh, he was coming from uh, Prague uh, from Czechoslovakia after doing tremendous amount of research with LSD in particular, yes. one of the pioneers of psychedelic research that today is undergoing a huge revolution and renaissance. Uh, so, um, so that was kind of the first birth. And then from that first birth, like a first wave of transpersonalism was emerging. I mean, the very idea that psychology should study spirituality was unheard of exactly <laughs> at exactly. that point it was like leave that to the religious nuts <laughs> <laughs> exactly like uh, today is like almost like uh, common sense and uh, in many new age circles but also like in the culture at large you know psychology and spirituality do, do come together mm -hmm. even like in major universities like Columbia they're doing like programs in spiritual psychology right mm -hmm. so it's really kind of uh, becoming mainstream <clears throat> but at that time you are completely right it was completely like something very new in fact I I can tell you this, uh, I remember, and you may also remember, <laughs> the Association for Transpersonal Psychology right. applied for an affiliate status with the American Psychological right. Association 
and it was denied. That's correct. That's correct. And still, I would say that the American Psychological Association can uh, look at, with some kind of degree of suspicion to transpersonal psychology. Yeah. You know, like uh, the American Psychological Association is very, uh, wants to be, wants to make the field very scientific, yeah. but very scientific in a very narrow sense. It's like following a model of science of like physics and biology. So anything that kind of like trying to expand, so, like ways of knowing and uh, different states of consciousness and study those in different ways. It's like something that they kind of tolerate, but they don't want to uh, be very prominent in their divisions. In, in <laughs> fact, the person who led the opposition to uh -huh. transpersonal psychology was a brilliant psychologist, a uh, former friend of mine, one of the founders of humanistic psychology, Rollo May. Yes. A, an existential psychologist, a brilliant man who considers himself a mystic. Yes. And yet he said... As far as he's concerned, transpersonal psychology is people who are practicing religion, mm -hmm. but trying to call it psychology. Yes. He said it's really just religion. Yes, you see, um, but this connects with uh, my my criticism of that first wave of transpersonal yes. psychology that you were referring to, mm -hmm. because in a way, I think there was something uh, of truth about Rollo May's perceptions, mm -hmm. <laughs> in the sense that, uh, at, you know, Maslow and Grove wanted to do a more scientific study of spirituality and consciousness, but then the first wave especially in particular with the wars of Ken Wilber and, uh, and others, and even Stanislav Grof as well, as mm -hmm. he kind of start unpacking the cosmological uh, implications of his research, you know, yeah. they start becoming like a, more like a, a giving us like dif different kind of like uh, stages of uh, spiritual development mm -hmm. and evolution, and all of them follow like this kind of unilinear uh, sequence leading to what they consider to be the greatest spiritual achievements. For mm -hmm. example, non-duality or absolute consciousness. You know? And that's, that's a religious claim. That's it, a religious it, claim. It, it is not... a religious claim if you look at the words that are used. But mm -hmm. my, my sense is, is this, that mm -hmm. the uh, w psychologists working in transpersonal mm -hmm. psychology all understood that the mystics would say, well, I'm using words to describe my experience, but in truth, it, it's not capable of being expressed in words. It's ineffable. Yes. And That's, yes. That there's some core experience of human consciousness at a deep level, which is brilliant, mm -hmm. overpowering, magnificent. Mm -hmm. People refer to it like cosmic consciousness mm -hmm. or God consciousness. And, yes. Uh, and they say, you know, whatever words I use will never begin to describe it. Yeah, I understand. As you know, like I'm also a student of uh, comparative mysticism, yes. and uh, then we'll do another uh, we'll do discussion another just so, on that. Uh, and that's uh, that has been one of the areas, uh, you know, focus of my studies and one of my passions. And uh, the more uh, deeper I've gone into the different traditions, and uh, the more I realize that uh, there are many different states. You know, cosmic consciousness is just one of them, but there are many different states and different traditions talk about. Um, a diversity of facets of consciousness and a diversity of even the ultimate endpoints. Mm -hmm. And what the problem with that first wave of transpersonal psychology that I received the name of being neoperennialist, like from the perennial philosophy, mm -hmm. this idea that all traditions are speaking about the same ultimate truth or the same yes, spiritual they universe. call it the pri primordial tradition. That's the book title by Houston Smith. Exactly. I've interviewed him about it. Exactly. I, I never got to interview Aldous Huxley, uh -huh. who, who died while I was still in high school. Oh. But, but he wrote a book called The Perennial Philosophy, exactly. making the same point. Exactly. So in a way, like um, the first major transpersonal theories, and I'm thinking here about Ken Wilber and uh, Stanislav Grof, and even Michael Wasman as well, they were perennial. They mm -hmm. are perennialists in different ways, in the sense that they do believe in this kind of universal spirituality. Mm -hmm. So diversity is only at, at the surface, you know, in the religious forms. But if you go deep down, if you go into the mystical core, yeah. all spirituality is like, uh, you know, like like different paths going to the same peak of the mountain right. or going to the same ocean. And this is something that today in religious, religious scholars or students of comparative mysticism, yeah. they do not accept. Uh, it would be very, very 
not very well uh, um, received or very well considered those particular views? Well, I think it's fair to say mm -hmm. that a academia today globally has been strongly influenced by postmodernism. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the main tenets of postmodernism, ironically, is that there is no such thing as, as a main tenet or an absolute truth <laughs> anywhere. Yes. Um, Yes, and uh, the thing with postmodern is that I think postmodern has something valuable because it brings uh, it brings us invite us to appreciate diversity and mm -hmm. pluralism, you know. Yeah. And we live in a very diverse and plural way that has been too often marginalized, and many people have been marginalized and not seen uh, because of lack of appreciation. Yeah. And a lot of these kind of like uh, kind of like uh, uh, perennialist uh, incursions into other traditions mm -hmm. have been experienced by traditions themselves as very colonialist. Yeah. You know, here here we are again, uh, Western male uh, theories telling, uh, mm -hmm. looking at the diversity of religious traditions of the world and telling how they are arranged in this particular mm -hmm. order leading to this particular point, you know. Mm -hmm. So as you can imagine, like, practitioners from all those different traditions, they would have, like, a lot of things to say. <laughs> and, and usually, as you point out, and I've experienced this as well, in each tradition where they talk about this is our hierarchy of spiritual attainments, it's usually their own tradition that takes you all the way to the top. <laughs> Exactly. Mm -hmm. You're right. So we have a variety of hierarchies, a variety of developmental paths, and then at the top we have a variety of different ultimate endpoints or mm -hmm. spiritual ultimates. And each tradition, of course, chooses the one that their own tradition doctrinally tells that is the one, you know? Yeah. So you have here the, the beautiful conflict of religious cosmologies, you mm -hmm. know? But coming back to um, transpersonal psychology, yes. uh, I would say that um, the second wave that uh, in a way like I uh, played some role in kind of like um, uh, alumbrating uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and developing together with other important theories like Richard Tarnas and John Heron and other people. Uh, the second wave was in part a reaction to what, what we experienced as some kind of like religionist biases uh, mm -hmm. in 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 the first wave of transparent psychology that connects with Rollo May's yeah. perception, you know, there was something there, you know, I don't think, I think he went too far, but mm -hmm. he was sensing something. Yeah. He, he was sensing that, that the practitioners of transpersonal psychology seemed very wedded to particular spiritual paths that they were studying. Exactly. And this has practical implications because, for example, during the 80s and the 90s, when the second wave was kind of like uh, prevalent, you know, many transpersonal and humanistic psychotherapists start interiorizing those schemes in their practice. Yeah. So then they would, for example, situate their clients according to those schemes. Oh, well, he's a shamanic practitioner, therefore is less evolved than this Buddhist practitioner, mm -hmm. less evolved than this non-dual practitioner, or if he's a theistic Christian, well, he's situated here. And in kind of implicitly or, or in kind of more subtle or less subtle ways, they were try to push their mm -hmm. clients through their spiritual counseling and coaching in the directions of those of those schemes. Mm -hmm. What in a way is boils down to religious indoctrination and not allowing the aborting the, the, the organic spiritual unfolding mm -hmm. and individuation of its human yeah. being. So in your book, Revisioning Transpersonal mm -hmm. Theory, you really take issue head on with with that approach. Yes. Basically you're saying we should give up the idea completely that there is such a thing as as a uh, absolute perspective from which every spiritual tradition can be judged. Exactly. That there is like a one that any of the one single absolute, you know, that can we can put over the rest, right? Yeah. Because we have all these ultimates, right? We have God, we have the Tao, we have emptiness in Buddhism, you know, we, and we have like actually like. 20,000 religious traditions in the 20, world. 20,000. Or more. <laughs> Today, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. It, religions spread uh, uh, and evolve just like biological species. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, uh, so in that context, like to even think, you know, that just one single tradition, you know, yeah. has the truth and the others, they don't, or it's a lesser truth is kind of problematic, you know, and, uh, and brings this other topic we'll discuss, I think, about spiritual narcissism. Well, you know, if we look at biology, 
theology as sort of a, a metaphor for mm -hmm. the, the spreading of religions, we humans consider ourselves to be at the very top <laughs> of, of the biological tree, so mm -hmm. to speak. We're at the top of the food chain, and I think we consider ourselves mm -hmm. to be superior to every other animal. And yes. um, I'm guessing that, that just as you challenge the idea that there is mm -hmm. a perspective from which we mm -hmm. can say which spiritual approach is better than mm -hmm. others, that the same thing might be true of biological mm -hmm. species. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, you know, my sense with that is like... Um, I believe human beings who are special mm -hmm. in very particular ways, as well as other species are special in other particular ways. Yeah. Um, I think that there is like a, a tremendous amount of uh, freedom and creativity in the human space species, you know, more than we can at least understand and fathom in the animal world, you know, yeah. uh, in terms of like uh, creative decision making, uh, intentionality. Mm -hmm. um, there are degrees of all of those in the animal world, but not to the extent. This is what I think makes us spe specialness, yeah. this degree of self-consciousness, you know. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't make us superior in an absolute way to other other species, biological yeah. species. That's like a disaster. I mean, when there's an enormous amount we can learn from earthworms. Absolutely, absolutely. The yeah. whole uh, the whole like disciplines of biomimic, you know, is mm -hmm. like uh, you know, it's engineering and technologic technological, you know, geeks like learning about, you know, solving their most challenging problems, like looking at nature, you know? Yeah. So there's so much we can learn mm -hmm. and they can, they can talk if we, if we, if we really like listen to them and with not only an open mind, but also an open heart. Mm -hmm. Because I think to learn from nature, it's not only just to open your mind, you need to open your heart, mm -hmm. I believe. So basically, your perspective is that uh, rather than looking for the most superior spiritual tradition with the highest guru with the most <laughs> attainments uh you are advocating an approach where every individual sees every other individual as someone we can uh learn from yes and someone maybe we can teach them something too yes we're all teachers and students i'm mm -hmm. sure you have so many many things to teach me i'm sure every person that is watching this video right now has something important to teach me and i'm sure there is something even if it's something very small i can teach to almost all of you mm -hmm. and uh and i think that's important but uh but my approach also brings like critical perspectives and i think that's also an important consideration i'm a spiritual pragmatist mm -hmm. in the sense that uh even though we cannot run traditions according to how well reflect or represent this kind of particular supposed uh, single spiritual ultimate, I think that some traditions are doing better than others in many ways, you know? Mm -hmm, sure. So, for example, I think, like, the Buddhist meditative tradition has so much to teach us about meditation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I think we have so much to learn from indigenous traditions about a uh, harmonious relationship with nature. Mm -hmm. And I think there is so much to learn from the Christian traditions about courage, charity, and, like, work for others, and the theory of liberation, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I think that all traditions have something to learn and to teach. And, uh, but not, uh, not from a superioristic way, but from a place of like mutual collaboration. Yeah. Well, I, I agree with you ab about that. I have often felt that the spiritual traditions of this planet are, we've, we've come to a point mm -hmm. in history where, uh, these traditions are the inheritance of every human being because yes. uh, the planet is, has become globalized. Yes, exactly. And then the other, uh, the other part that I think is important is of this kind of uh, spiritual pragmatism, you know, is that, uh, for me, it's not so much so important if people are practicing Buddhism or shamanism or, or, you know, or they are hugging trees or they are being conscious parents, you know. Uh, for me, all, almost every human activity can be engaged as a spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. So for me, what is important is like how these people engaging this practice are becoming less self-centered, less narcissistic, mm -hmm. less egoic, you know, in a narrow mm -hmm. sense. How, how that practice, how that path is making them a more integrated human being, you know, mm -hmm. versus a person with conflicts and tensions between their sexuality and spirituality, inner, inner dissociations in their hearts, you know, and how that path uh, fosters something that is very important today, eco-social, political justice in the world, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that for me, and these are orientations, and of course each of them have their own challenges and and they require a lot of qualifications and mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, but uh, I think that orientations that uh, for me helps me to, when I see people practicing different spiritual paths, you know, it helps mm -hmm. me like, okay, this is working for this person, you know, mm -hmm. or, or not. <laughs> so there's a subtle point here that you're making because you're saying, yes, it's a good idea to begin to evaluate spiritual paths, spiritual traditions according to such characteristics as how they help the practitioners uh, become less narcissistic, yes. let go of ego, mm -hmm. uh, or how, how they help their practitioners engage in, in the processes of uh, social activism mm -hmm. and uh, fighting injustice in the world. But you're also saying at the same time that those criteria are not absolute. Yes. Well, they need to be tremendously contextualized. For example, when I talk about eco-socio-political justice, Whose justice, right? yeah. <laughs> as it was once as famously, no, by a greatest philosopher, no, whose justice, like, and this is one of the issues of our kind of global times, right? Mm -hmm. That different, there's a conflict of rights, there's a conflict of justice systems going on in our yeah. global village. So I think, like, um, these are like, we all, I think it's important to have certain kind of like values that we bring into the table in the global mm -hmm. dialogue, you know, uh, in that particular way, you know. But even, for example, if you look at the, um, you know, the narcissism, you know, there's also the pitfall of self-delusion, right? Yeah. Many people, um, maybe you know some, uh, they're practicing spirituality and they believe they are like growing in tremendous spiritual heights and depths yeah. and everybody around them, they, f you know, they feel, wow, this person is quite inflated or it's like Sometimes it's becoming no more narcissistic. called <laughs> the stink of enlightenment. <laughs> the stink of enlightenment. Yeah. So in that regard, I think it's very important the sense of the, the community, you know, the, the peers, you know, the sense of peer to peer. We have like f spiritual friends and, uh, and peers that are going to call us on these mm -hmm. things, you know, like, you know, you are practicing, you are drinking ayahuasca every month or San Pedro or whatever, you know, and you think you're going somewhere, but actually you, every day we see you every week, you look back to like more self-centered, you just talk about your spiritual experiences, you seem to be less caring of your dog, what's going on? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and the ultimately that's with the, the other test or orientation like that is like a dissociation right yeah. that's a very tricky one because uh so many religious traditions historically you know we could say that they, they were they had many dis dissociative practices you know practice that would repress sexuality practice that would repress the body or practice that would uh see with suspicion like kind of like a um, passionate the passions you know of the human heart you know so here i bring like this a more more na normative dimension mm -hmm. i'm saying like you know i think the traditions already reconstructed themselves in those particular directions and incorporating mm -hmm. dimensions of human experience that in the past historically for many different reasons they were suspicious, but now they are doing it, so I'm, I'm really affirming that. Well, if we look at human history, mm -hmm. it's fair to say, I think, that uh, many wars have been fought because of uh, religious conflicts. Yes, yes. That's, you know, it's, you know, uh, I've, I've studied uh, a bit also interreligious violence in the world today, present, and some, uh, some is in the past, and, and you can always see more than this, um, you know, religious ideas. There's always a lot of economic factors, mm -hmm. political factors, yep. ethnic factors. Mm -hmm. It would be, be problematic to reduce uh, the cause of an interreligious war conflict to just one factor, but it's still it's easier to kill your neighbor when you think you have God on your side, yeah. right? When you think you have God on your side and he does not, or when you think your spiritual ultimate is the superior religion than the others, it's easier. So in a way, all, all these things that we are discussing in this kind of like second wave of transpersonal psychology, more participatory, has relevance for uh, today's interreligious uh, Global yeah. wars and, and as I recall, you were engaged uh, with an organization whose mm -hmm. very purpose was helping religions to uh, operate more in harmony with each other and less conflict between yes. them. Yes, that was called Religions for Peace at the United Nations, and uh, that was a beautiful um, encounter uh, for me 
Personally, because the Secretary General, when I asked him why, why did I, why did I got invited here? I'm a transpersonal psychologist. He told me he had read my first book and that it had shaped the way he approached, uh, his, mm -hmm. some of his dialogues. And, uh, and that's the best thing one can receive, right? That, uh, one of your babies, uh, right? Yeah. Because a book is a baby that has a life of its own. Suddenly someone takes it and, 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 and influence something that is yeah. important, you know, a book that was more theoretical, right? Well, yeah. I think it's one of the most exciting things mm -hmm. about your approach because uh, many people have suggested that transpersonal psychology is a, it's a lot of navel gazing <laughs> yes. and uh, people who are, you know, isolated from the world at large and, mm -hmm. and uh, what good is going to come out of it anyway? <laughs> yeah. uh, a lot of people, you know, engaging in fantasies that they are mm. more spiritually evolved. But yes. what you're saying mm. is that this approach, the transpersonal mm -hmm. theory can make a meaningful difference in yes. helping the uh, world's religions to mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. Get along with each other. Yes, absolutely, and uh, and also, of course, like uh, I would say that um, transpersonal psychology has made, uh, I think, a very important contribution to psychotherapeutic and clinical practice. You know, mm -hmm. I think like uh, the distinction between the psychotic crisis and the spiritual emergencies. Mm -hmm. You know, very important. You know, yes. I still have a number of people in psychiatric institutions being medicated that with a different approach to could mm -hmm. be happy, fulfilling lives. So that's something that is very, very important, you know, and, uh, and of course, uh, you know, the inclusion of like um, some spiritual and religious problems in the DSM for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, you know, there was yeah. transpersonal psychology in that. So it has been doing things more practical uh, in the last decades, and mm -hmm. I think we're all very, very happy over this. Well, this it's, it's one of the kernels, I would say, of mm -hmm. transpersonal psychology is, is that you don't dismiss spiritual experience as being uh, the product of some kind of a return to an infantile exactly. state exactly. the way Freud did, or mm -hmm. uh, as, as, as some sort of delusion the mm -hmm. way I think I think many behaviorists would treat it. You you mm -hmm. regard these experiences as yes. uh, authentic, at least authentic for the people who are having them. Exactly. And also to add to that, you believe in transformation. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is one of the things that distinguishes, I would say, most transpersonal psychology from other psychologies, you know. The belief in transformation, you know, not just, um, you know, healing the symptoms or just helping the person to cope with. Mm -hmm. No, there is a, a deep-seated belief that person can radically change, you know, yeah. even someone who has been diagnosed with psychosis well accompanied could come the other way around if the process is well accompanied and pushed forward, you know, mm -hmm. versus like being kind of uh, um, slept anesthetized with medication, you know, yeah. then this person can re-emerge re in a higher state of integration, you know, mm -hmm. and these cases of this, you know, so there is like this trust, uh, in ultimately it's a trust in the human nature, mm -hmm. in how human nature can really from within kind of like re regenerate itself. Mm -hmm. Like we hope Gaia will do mm -hmm. as well. <laughs> you, you know, there to me though, there's an irony here. Yeah. Well, many <laughs> actually, but one of them is, is this: you are now known as as one of the pioneers of the mm -hmm. second wave mm -hmm. of transpersonal theory mm -hmm. and transpersonal psychology. Yet, uh, as I listen to your approach, it strikes me as very reminiscent mm -hmm. of William James, <laughs> who who died over a hundred years ago. Yes. And long before transpersonal psychology as a discipline was founded, mm -hmm. but I regard him as the first transpersonal psychologist. I totally agree with you, Jeff, and uh, and I think that the, the, the parallels you're building uh, are meaningful because, uh, you know, William James, I also consider him one of the pioneers of the field, even if before the field was born, yeah. right? With his experiments, with states of consciousness, with even uh, nitrous oxidors, or, uh, his interest in mysticism, you know, from yeah. the perspective of psychology. I mean, uh, and he was the one, you know. But also, yes. in, in particular, his focus on the plurality. Exactly. And pragmatism. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Plurality and pragmatism. Like, uh, I learned quite a deal from him from uh, also from uh, Isaiah Berlin, you know, in today's world, you know, many philo philosophers that uh, have been interested in uh, pragmatism, you know, mm -hmm. have been like very important influences, and Gullian James was one of those. Yeah. So uh, I think you're 
making like an important mm -hmm. bridge there. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you one other question. Now, mm -hmm. we talked briefly about postmodernism. Yes. And how postmodernism would be consistent with your approach to uh, spirituality and religions mm -hmm. in general, that there is no absolute perspective mm -hmm. uh, from which we can judge spiritual traditions. Mm -hmm. But let me ask you, do you consider yourself a postmodernist? Thanks for the question. Not at all. Uh -huh. <laughs> Not at all. I think, like I would say, I would consider myself a meta-modern mm -hmm. uh, author in the sense that I integrate uh, insights and ways of knowing from pre-modernity, modernity, and post-modernity. Mm -hmm. This is like a contemporary current called meta-modernity. Meta-modernity. Yeah, yeah, I like uh, that. So meta-modern. Uh -huh. But uh, one of the um, things that distinguishes very strongly my approach from postmodernism is like both modernity and postmodernity, they completely like um, bracket or deny any kind of ontological, any kind of reality to a spiritual reference, you know. They are saying, well, people are having a lot of different experiences, but they happen in your brain, they are kind of symbolic process of the mind, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. but they do not exist out there, you know. And uh, in my approach, I'm kind of much more open to um, that kind of like the reality base of what we encounter, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's something that postmodernists or even modern critical yeah. individuals would totally like say, no, 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 we don't want to go there. Yeah, I, I know they do say that, although I don't think it's really yeah, well integrated yes. into their philosophy. It's just sort of baggage. I agree. I think they're carrying along yes. with them. But let, let me uh, put the question to you a little differently. Mm -hmm. um, do you think there are any absolute truths? Define absolute. Well, <laughs> uh, good. Uh, okay. Um, do you think one and one, one plus one equals two? Is that an absolute truth? Probably in a context. Uh -huh. In a context of... Needs um, to be viewed in context. Exactly. I exactly. See. So It's like with all the geometrical, um, geometrical truths, yeah. uh, depending on the kind of geometrical, uh, what you're playing with. You know? yeah. uh, in other words, you're, you're not a Platonist. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, for me, like uh, you know, the you know, there are, I, th I don't, I don't have any problem, for example, with accepting that uh, there are many universal things about the human condition. Mm -hmm. You know, we all have eyes, unless you have a handicap, you know, we all eat, you know, we yeah. breathe, we reproduce, you know. It's no problem. They are called homoversals, mm -hmm. right? Universal to some of the human condition, and there's no problem with that. The thing is, like, uh, once as anthropologists has taught to us for decades, once you look at the meaning of all those things for different cultures, your yeah. son, I mean, everybody eats. But what it, eating means, means drastically different things yes. across the cultures, right? Mm -hmm. The same with breathing. Mm -hmm. Breathing, everybody breathes, but what it means, means, right? And human beings were like a meaning, meaning producing species and like where we live in a meaningful universe, yes. you know, that I think in part we co-create with uh, a meaningfulness that I believe exists out there, but that's a different topic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, yes, the, the question is, I suppose, ultimately, if, is there meaning in the universe independent of us? Yes, that's one of the big questions. That's mm -hmm. one of the big questions. Uh, my bet would be, yes, that uh, our, our capabilities f f to, for meaning production emerge from the cosmos because we're part of the cosmos. Yeah. That's what it means to participate in the cosmos. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, wherever you want to believe that that meaningfulness or that is like a spirit orchestrating the whole thing or that somehow these meaning producing creatures emerge mm -hmm. randomly, yeah. I think that both are equally awesome miracles mm -hmm. that create the same sense of like awe and reverence mm -hmm. to, to being alive in this cosmos. Because I know, for example, um, Houston Smith, a mm -hmm. philosopher of religion, I interviewed him many, many times He's before delightful. he died. A wonderful man, but he would have said that uh, the closer we get to God, the more meaningful everything becomes. Mm -hmm. I would, I would, I would agree, um, but I would qualify. I wouldn't yeah. use the term God again because it's a term that I would only be meaningful for a number of traditions, uh, yeah. many billions of individuals that they are more into theistic traditions. You know, because not every spiritual tradition believes in God. No. No, not at all. <laughs> and, uh, and for many, for example, uh, you know, I'm also a San Pedrista and I hang with indigenous people and indigenous people 
it's not about God. Uh, the meaningful experience is like it's about in connection, in interrelatedness with nature between themselves collectively, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a very a different type of meaningfulness, you mm -hmm. know, than that meaning comes from being close to God. I think it's different. Uh, for me, the meaning of life ultimately is something that uh, in Spanish we say is el sentido de la vida. Mm. Sentido de la vida. Sentido also means sentir, to feel. So for me, the meaning of life is not something that you are going to get with our minds. Or the meaning of life is this or that, a <laughs> statement. Yeah. It's something that we can feel in our flesh. Mm -hmm. in, you know, you can feel it or not. Well, that's, yeah, <laughs> now we're getting to your emphasis on embodiment, mm -hmm. embodied spirituality. Mm -hmm. and, and you mm -hmm. mean that quite literally, I believe. Yes, yes. And that's kind of like, a, I think that's a very important uh, uh, development because uh, I think there has been so much suffering uh, in the world and continues to be a lot of unnecessary suffering due to what I perceive as a lack of embodiment of spirituality. Mm -hmm. For example, all the, all the sexual abuses, that uh, that that all the tragic sexual abuses from Christian priests, from from Hindu uh, or Buddhist teachers, from shamans today yeah. is is pandemic. Okay, it, it's pandemic, yes, it is. I, right. I would agree. So how how to understand that? You know, we can understand it in many different ways. You know, there is people who could be you know very evolved in a developmental line, right? Spiritually or psychic. You know, like. Yeah. But uh, many of these people, sexually, interpersonal, emotionally. They are in different places. They could be kids or pre-adolescent or, or they could be also wounded themselves. They mm -hmm. have been abused and then they perpetuate sexual abuse. And that's very common, yeah. as you know. So basically, uh, uh, spiritualities that uh, uh, helps people to, uh, to uh, cultivate what I call a heart chakra spirituality. Mm -hmm. A chakra from your heart, from your heart chakra, and consciousness and up, but kind of forget or dismiss or sublimate or try to control the body and sexuality. I think they, you, you start creating a dissociation there, an association. And uh, what I'm advocating is for a spirituality that really like uh, that really incorporates mm -hmm. the wholeness of human experience, including sexuality, including the body, in a way that. Uh, that all those walls can be more gradually integrated. Because many people uh, have been raised to believe that the body is like the antithesis of spirituality. Exactly. Carnal interests are considered unspiritual. Yes, they were considered demonic. Yeah. In Christianity and in many places, uh, still considered sinful, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yeah. Any kind of like desire or even in, in other traditions, not theistic, like certain Buddhist schools, Mm -hmm. Predominant Buddhist schools, actually, sexual desire always was seen with suspicious, you know, this is something that's going to take you, you know, mm -hmm. uh, out of track in the path uh -huh. of enlightenment, you know. Mm -hmm. So this is why it's so important to record all these dimensions. I think there was some, there maybe was some evolutionary meaningfulness to that in the past, yeah. in the sense that there could be, we could, it's an hypothesis. <laughs> but we could hypothesize that there was a time in human evolution when the values of the heart and human consciousness were kind of getting stronger, kind of like individuating themselves for a more instinctively driven human life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as we, as we move from being more animals to human beings, whatever that <laughs> distinction yeah. is, there could it makes sense, you know, that there was a necessity to, to, to suppress some of those very strong impulses, you know, to cultivate those mm -hmm. states. But I don't think that in most cases here in the West, that's longer the case, you know. I think there's a time to, to, you know, having cultivated those, the heart and consciousness to, to, to reclaim and redeem, you know, and, and invite them into the spiritual feast. Now well. we're getting into uh, some very interesting material. I mean, what does it mean to be fully human? Yes. <laughs> that's a huge question. Uh -huh. I mean, that's one of the objects of transpersonal psychology, right? It's a psychology that uh, claims to approach the whole, it's a whole person psychology. Mm -hmm. They say, well, other psychologists are looking mostly at the mind, you know, and the, and the brain and uh, even these parts of cognitive functioning, you know, and uh -huh. also psychoanalysis of emotions. But... Uh, I think transparent psychology tries to be a whole person psychology that, uh, mm -hmm. that, that takes into consideration the fullness of the human one, being. One of your critiques, as I understand it, mm -hmm. of the you know, first wave of <laughs> transpersonal psychology is that it was rather, I think you use the phrase, cognitive-centered. Yes, I think so. I think mm -hmm. so. Also, uh, too much emphasis on states of consciousness, mm 
mm-hmm. that are wonderful, and I'm very interested in them, yeah. uh, with not so much emphasis in the integration of those experiences, in an embodied ex- integration, you know, mm-hmm. in the body, in, in the different parts of oneself, in the community, in society, mm-hmm. you know. There was this fascination with good reasons, because remember, we're, there were, I mean, all these of consciousness were like suddenly like available for us, um, Western modern people that have been for many centuries, uh, uh, you know, uh, dominated by certain forms of Christianity that uh, mm-hmm. religiously that have not been really supportive of those uh, mm-hmm. explorations, right? On the contrary. So then, therefore, uh, those, those years was like all this fascination and this excitement with good reasons, you know. But then there was like uh, this kind of uh, cognizantism, you know, that was like, like this set of consciousness are the best, you know, over others, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I take a more systemic ecological approach. Well, I think it's it's not just the religious traditions. It seems to me that culture as a whole mm-hmm. rewards people for being smart. Absolutely. Pr- pretty much more than anything else. You can get some rewards for being uh, musical or artistic or if you dance or sing well but by and large for the yes. great masses of people the smarter you are the more rewards you will get uh, from the culture so we exactly. begin to think of ourselves as um, almost disembodied intellects yes yes and there was some uh, fascinating uh, phenomenological research done on modern western individuals and then they would they found out that most people at any moment of the day when they, they were like there was like this cue that to, to pay attention to their experience they were they're experiencing here this yeah. is who i am yeah they, they didn't have consciousness of their bodies at all mm-hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And uh, I think you are right. Like uh, this cognizance is like this overvaluing of one particular form of intelligence of it over others. This intellectual, logical, analytical over others is a disservice to ourselves. Mm-hmm. It also creates problems with uh, the cross-cultural encounters with other people that have developed other intelligences, and then we consider them immediately to be much more primitive. <laughs> yeah. And also has a huge impact in our children and our education because because this is what gets rewards. Education gets very cognizantric as mm-hmm. well. You yeah. know, the, um, how do you say, the daycare, you know, um, kindergarten. Mm. Kindergarten yes. is, is a pretty holistic education in most yeah, countries. Yeah, yeah. But as soon as you leave the kindergarten, <laughs> everything gets to here. <laughs> and, and even in kindergarten, it seems to me, if I remember, mm-hmm. uh, we were taught uh, basically, you, you know, if you're feeling anything in your body, then you're probably sick. <laughs> It, that basically, you shouldn't feel your body. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, that. Oh, that pains me. <laughs> hearing, hearing that. Well, I think it's very American. And uh-huh. in, in fact, the, in the 19th century, as mm-hmm. I recall, there was a, a famous uh, fellow. Graham was his name. He invented mm-hmm. the Graham cracker, and oh, yes. he he went around advocating that that people should not feel their bodies yes. unless oh they're God. sick. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. And, uh-huh. and yet, it's, it strikes me that the body is, <laughs> I, I think of the body as a spiritual antenna. Absolutely. Yes, yes. And I even would go farther. It's a spiritual antenna, but I think it's a spiritual um, manifestation in itself. You yes. Know? Uh, if we understand um, uh, spirituality as something that is also embodied, not something that happens in more subtle levels of reality or yeah. happens in your consciousness but you understand that the, the perhaps part of the amazing thing about planet earth is that uh, it's a place perhaps unique in the cosmos probably not probably, <laughs> in, not, in, probably yeah. not in which uh, in which there is sentient life and uh, and you know consciousness and matter can come together and embodied love can take place incarnation incarnation can take yeah. place then this planet becomes like something really like Special in its own way, not in an ancient anthro, and you know, <laughs> anthropocentric and kind of like a geocentric way, you know, yeah. but especially in the terms of um, their special role in meaningful spiritual evolution, you know, and uh, and I think the body is like, you know, it's the tool, mm-hmm. it's kind of the tool, you know, and uh, one of the things sometimes working with um, students and. Uh, with people, uh, it's like sometimes there is, there is a point in the spiritual development when you do just meditation or consciousness that, and I've, I've talked with many practitioners and they agree, it's like there's a point in which unless you don't make changes in the hardware, mm-hmm. this, the new softwares cannot fully, fully 
be permanent there. You know, people access these states and then they come back to their life. Their whole habits come back. Mm -hmm. The neurosis comes back and so forth, you know, especially when they work with medicine sometimes. But when you, you know? say changes in the hardware, <laughs> what do you mean exactly? Changes in the very physical, uh, the structure of the physical and energetic body of mm -hmm. the person. You know, and, the uh, physical and energetic yes, body. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. So the kind of changes, like, uh, and of course, many of those disciplines are, are, are informing and promoting those changes, you yeah. know. But sometimes, for example, disciplines that are just only just meditation, mm -hmm. you know, sitting, my body's sitting, my mm -hmm. body's immobile, yeah. <laughs> and I just count, count my breath and just have meditation. Those disciplines by themselves, I don't think that sometimes can really affect uh, deep changes in mm -hmm. the hardware of the body. And uh, that doesn't mean that they cannot go to amazing places and liberations of consciousness in consciousness. But uh, for most of the people and even awake people I've seen in those traditions, I don't see like a fully embodied, uh, individuated spiritual and you've person. spent many years meditating. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, about 15 years, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, long retreats every day, yes, it was like a big commitment. But, um, yeah, there were many things happening there for me that uh, one was that I realized, like, hmm, I don't think I want to become like my teachers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, any kind of path, um, it's, you know, you see the, you see the mm -hmm. exemplars, you know, and uh, there was a lack of, in that particular traditional, no need yeah. to mention it, there was a lack of vitality, there was a lack of uh, sensuality, uh, there was a very uh, almost an aloof coldness uh, in that particular tradition. So, and I was also becoming aware myself of... Uh, through contact with other more somatic approaches uh, in the West, and uh, that the you know that there was so much you know sp spiritually speaking that one can learn as we go you delve deeply into the body, and uh, even in sexuality and uh, mm -hmm. in many other places you know other resources and so for me like a you know like a f you know more holistic integral spiritual development mm -hmm. needs to engage the two poles the pole of consciousness and the pole of energy. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I guess another important feature of, of your approach in, in your book, Revisioning Transpersonal <laughs> Theory, is the idea that uh, we don't just have to study the existing spiritual traditions, all 20,000 of them yes. on this planet. It's, it's perfectly appropriate for people to carve new paths. Yes, that's a very important idea. Thank you. Yes, exactly. Um, basically, I'm kind of like uh, trying to affirm and empower uh, what I call a spiritual individuation. Mm -hmm. You know, like the capability of each human being to to individ. You know, in psychology, you know, we talk about psychological individuation, but as you move to spirituality, suddenly. You know, the different schools, they go towards more heterogeneity. Oh, no, excuse me, homogeneity, right? Yes. They were, they were, homogeneity, they were, they were, yeah. They like the same dress and the dress mm -hmm. their head, yeah. they practice yeah. the same meditation, like, right? yeah. so the diversity is kind of constrained. And, uh, there might, he, again, there might have been some good historical reasons for that in some mm -hmm. periods. But I think today, especially for the Westerns and especially after, you know, we, we after the individual, there is, there is problems with our, problems with our individualistic ethos. But there are some good things as well. Yeah. And I think that uh, uh, one of one is that we can really uh, become who we are, you know, like as we embrace our spiritual individuation. And for that, uh, yes, you can learn from different traditions. And also, um, you can also, uh, your own body and your own being can uh, bring forth uh, mm -hmm. novel spiritual practices. Yeah. Because yes. I remember in, in my youth, uh, I was told, I don't remember from whom, but many times that, uh, oh, there are many spiritual paths that are going to work for you, but you need to choose one and stick with it. Yes. And you're suggesting mm -hmm. something a little different, that people can be more creative than that. Yes. Um, I think that's, that's a typical argument uh, against, like, for example, New Age eclecticism, mm -hmm. right? Oh, these people who are like, like hummingbirds from flower and flower, they are never really going to go to any depth. I would say depends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> depends on the approach and depends of the depth of the person. Uh, and there is, there are people who, who, you know, who are solid, uh, very evolved in many ways, and they can tremendously grow from contact with different traditions. And I think today, who, who, who is not in contact with different traditions yeah. in our global village today, spiritually, you know? And that doesn't mean that there is no value in going very deep in one tradition. Yeah. And actually, I think going deep in one tradition, at least for a certain amount of years, it can create a, f a foundation, a solidity mm -hmm. from which to later, like, 
branch out and incorporate other things from other places. Mm -hmm. It's not the same when, you know, when someone, you know, reads several books on uh, shamanism and Buddhism and then start offering workshops on shamanism <laughs> and Buddhism yeah. Yeah. than when uh, our friend, uh, my ex teacher John Halifax, you know, yes. creates her integration of Buddhism and shamanism after many, many years of study of the two traditions. It's yeah. not the same. That's right. I understand that. It's, I mean, I suppose you could say it's like travel. It's good to travel to many countries, but it's also good to become deeply engaged with at least one culture. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's a good. That's a good analogy. Mm -hmm. Well, Jorge Ferrer, what a pleasure to have this discussion with you, uh, and I'm pleased to let our viewers know that that you're here with me in Albuquerque. We'll be doing many more interviews uh, while you're here. Thank you very much. I'm all the pleasure of having mine. Thank you for mm -hmm. being with me, and thank you for being with us. <laughs> Thank you.